start. Welcome everybody to um, the last high rounds of May um, into a holiday weekend. So hopefully people will get a little sunshine and exercise. I'm really excited to have Dr. Sanjay Mehta present with the best title so far of 2021. So everyone needs to step up their game. Um, and I have, I, I, um, we've been asking people to give, give us their bios, um, even though most people know each other on this call, but this is just great because I'm learning stuff about Sanjay too. So I'm going to tell you some of the stuff he shared with me. So, um, Dr. Mehta grew up in Ohio, slowly migrated West and made his way to San Diego where he found sunshine and a beautiful wife. He is now the proud father of a 10 year old daughter who loves to cook and an 11 year old son who loves soccer and eating his sister's baked goods. Uh, Sanjay remains committed to all Cleveland sports team and is working hard to make sure his children are too. He also enjoys running, cycling, basketball and the outdoors, um, which was significantly hampered by the Cleveland weather where he grew up. He is currently a professor of infectious diseases, which I didn't know. So congratulations, Sanjay. That's so awesome. Um, where he studies HIV and parasitic infections. He has worked across the world in Mexico, India, Romania and frequently in Brazil. Um, after several trips and numerous classes, his Portuguese became passable, but not so much for his samba. This is great. Um, so I'm going to pass this along uh, to Dr. Meda, who um, clearly has also now shifted into uh, COVID work, um, which he didn't mention. Uh, and, and I'm really excited to hear what he's going to be sharing with us today. Thanks, Joe. So I'm not a professor. I must have Misedited that. Oh no! <laughs> well, you will be soon. So, <laughs> no, no worries. Um, well, thanks everyone for having me. Uh, so, um, my talk is titled "V for Variant," and um, if you're of the younger generation, you may think this refers to V for Vendetta, but actually, this refers to V for Visitor, um, which scared the crap out of me when I was a kid. Um, this TV show. Uh, where the visitors were aliens who came in to came to Earth and sort of integrated with us, and we're slowly going to just wipe us out because their their planet no longer, exists. which may be not exactly what this, these variants are doing, but it kind of feels a little bit like that right now. Um, so the the stuff I'm going to present today is actually not any work that I'm doing, but it, it's just. I, I feel like there's been a lot of literature, and there's, I shouldn't say a lot, there's a immense amount of literature uh, with regards to the COVID. It's, you know, it's, it's definitely a water hose that's flowing, and it's really hard to keep up uh, with what's going on. Um, and now with the variants and then all these different variants, it's gotten really confusing. So this was my attempt to both for myself and for hopefully for all of you to kind of synthesize some of the data to help us all kind of understand what what all this means uh, moving forward. Um, and, and so feel free to ask questions along the way. Um, I'm gonna go through a lot of data. Surprisingly, probably two thirds to three fourths of it is stuff that was either uh, released and on MedArchive or BioArchive or published within the last month. <laughs> all the stuff is just going so fast. Um, it's really hard to keep up. Um, so I have no disclosures. Uh, I will say that be, <laughs> due to to kind of keep things simple, I am going to refer to the variants by their colloquial names a lot. Um, and, you know, it's not something that's ideal. We don't like to attribute uh, strains or infections to places, but it does make it very confusing when there are so many of these variants with numbers and letters after them that um, it's a little harder to keep track of. So I will use the colloquial names through, through the talk. All right. So, so what are variants? Um, so we all know that viruses evolve with time as error, errors occur during their copying process. And most of the time those errors are insignificant, but some have consequences both either for the viral life cycle or for path pathogenicity. Um, and sometimes those mutations can lead to the virus becoming more transmissible due to things such as better binding to their cognate receptor, improved environmental stability, or just higher production uh, resulting in, in a higher viral load, which oftentimes is associated with increased infectiousness. All right, so here's the map of the genome. And 
you guys have all seen this multiple times, just kind of reminding everyone that um, you know, about two thirds of the virus is these non-structural proteins, ORF1 and ORF, I'm sorry, ORF1A and 1B. And within there are the uh, RNA dependent ribosome, RNA dependent RNA polymerase, an exonuclease, a helicase. Um, and then the structural component is, is uh, is much smaller and includes spike, envelope, membrane, and nucleocapsid. Sorry to interrupt, Sanjay, or not Sanjay. Can everyone mute if you're not speaking? We've got some background noise. I don't know if I can. All right. Sorry, Sanjay, go ahead. So um, coronaviruses um, have a very low mutation rate because they have an exonucleus, so they have a sort of a copy uh, proofing mechanism uh, as part of their polymerase. And so this is a nice little paper that looked at um, the evolution of other coronaviruses over time. Uh, on the top uh, left is OC43, the, you know, the common, common cold coronavirus, and you can see that um, the, our, the divergence over time has been very, very slow. Um, uh, this is from the 70s, so about 50 years with a rate of, I think it's 0 0.00021 mutations per year. Um, and that's uh, a little faster with MERS, which is the top right um, over a shorter time period. And even a little faster for SARS, uh, SARS-1, uh, which was again over a shorter time period. So, and then if you kind of plot the time periods uh, versus the substitution rate, you can see, you know, when we look at things over a shorter time period, things tend to evolve a little faster as the virus kind of better adapts to, to the human host. And then, then after that, it kind of slows down uh, with time. And that's pretty expected. So this is SARS-CoV-2. Uh, the mutation rate right now is about 0 0.00075 substitutions per site per year. Um, again, very, very slow. Um, so it's not really evolving that fast overall. But then we have these variants. And then how do these variants arise? Um, so this is kind of a question that was bugging me a little bit. Um, and so this is a study, a recent study out of um, uh, UNC Chapel Hill. It's still, it's still in, um, so a lot of the stuff, I'm, again, I'm presenting is still on BioArchive or MedArchive. So it hasn't been peer reviewed. Um, but I'll just kind of present the data because it is interesting. Uh, so they took about 94 uh, individuals and they tried to sequence their virus at two time points. And of those individuals, um, you know, most of the time the, the virus was essentially the same, um, but they did find evolution in about six people. Um, and four of them, sorry, I think they only sequenced actually a, a, about a, um, six of them. The other ones I couldn't sequence uh, both time points. Uh, and four of them showed basically zero or only one uh, single nucleotide variation between one time points. But only in two of these 94 individuals, they showed significant evolution. So uh, in one, there was nine polymorphisms that are, are accumulated over 15 days, and another one, 23 over 18 days, which is, again, hugely fast compared to the overall rate of evolution. Um, so a, a little strange. And you know, they don't know um, if this was due to super infection, dual infection, or some other uh, just weird um, ad adaptation in these in these individuals. Now, it's you know, there's a lot. The study needs some work still, and, and um, but uh, we may see it in the literature soon. So, but there are other reports of variants developing in patients that are persistent shedders. So we've all seen people who you know had detectable virus 90 days from their initial infection. So there are, there are individuals that really shed for a long period of time, and particularly those that are you know, immunocompromised. Uh, the case on the left was in the New England Journal, actually, in, 2000, in kind of mid-2020. And it was a, an individual that um, had received rituximab and was treated three times with remdesivir, but was continuing to shed even at day 152, they were able to sequence out the virus. Um, this person did not um, get monoclonal antibody or convalescent plasma. So the, the viral evolution here was all, uh, at least this is in spike, it was due to you know, endogenous selection factors. And what I wanted to point out to you there was that this particular individual evolved this E 
484K mutation on their own, um, which is one that we'll talk about later in the talk, uh, which is an important um, evolutionary uh, mutation that has occurred in some of the uh, variants that we're, we're seeing today. And then uh, on the right is another case of an individual who did get convalescent plasma and was a persistent shedder. And with each time the individual got convalescent plasma, it pushed, uh, a, um, it pushed a variant uh, out uh, called, due to the selection pressure uh, with mutations, particularly in the spike protein, and those green those green lines represent uh, after someone got com after this individual got convalescent plasma, all of a sudden this this mutated virus kind of took off, uh, was selected out, and, and took over. And those mutations that were present are are some of the ones that we've seen in in other variants as well. So again, suggesting that some of these are due to selection pressure. So if you take the entire genome, uh, where is most of the diversity in the genome? So when we kind of take all the, the sequences that we have, um, so these are the ones from GISA, so next strain has kind of put this together. Um, and you can see that this is the entropy, so this is the variance kind of at each nucleotide site in the virus. And you can see that there's this sort of um, bundle of, of sites in spike where there are, there's a lot more diversity there. And then a little bit of nucleocapsid, and as well, there's a little spike um, in one of the other open reading frames uh, out to the right there. Um, so those are the two. Um, the, a group at MIT then kind of took a look at this, and what they did is they said, all right, so what is different about SARS-CoV-2 versus other coronavirus, or other parts of SARS-CoV-2 that are evolving differently than we would expect for uh, a typical Sarbeco coronavirus. And so they plotted the, um, the, rate of the fraction of amino acids that have been changing in, in standard or regular Sarbeco coronaviruses with those that are uh, changing in um, SARS-CoV-2 and you know, looked at a correlation. And they found a, a couple of interesting things. They found that actually spike was probably actually evolving a little slower than expected. Um, and that um, you know, these were Sarbeco coronaviruses that were jumping from species to species, and spike um, um, might uh, need to evolve faster when you're switching from one bat species to another bat species, or you know, etc. So it, it made sense that now that it was in a human, maybe it was move, moving a little slower. But they did notice that the nucleocapsid was really um, evolving quickly, um, much more than expected. Um, and so when they looked a little further. Um, they found that the, the sites where it was um, evolving the fastest uh, were actually B cell epitopes. So this is a plot of um, nucleocapsid. And I'll, can you see my arrow? Uh, yes. Yeah, OK, great. So this, these black lines represent um, B cell epitopes, so kind of areas where B, uh, antibodies are predicted to bind. Um, this, this bottom thick red line represents conserved amino acids, and the one just above it oops, here represents uh, mutations. And you can see that there's a little hot spot of mutation right here, and it matches up to this B cell epitope. And they were just saying that, um, again, this, the, the two matched up, suggesting that maybe some of this diversity or maybe these mutations are being driven by uh, antibody binding to this to the site of the um, nuclear capsid. All right, so a little back. That was a little background. So how do we make sense of these variants, right? There's a there's a bunch of questions that I have, and I'm sure you guys have. And I'll try to go through some of these. So one, you know, how prevalent are these in the population? And it turns out that's changing literally day to day, depending on where you look. Um, are the variants due to selective pressure? possibly, as we just talked about. Are the variants, is a variant or are variants more infectious than the wild type? And we'll, we'll get into that a little bit. Are variants more pathogenic than the wild type? And we'll get into that a little bit. Are the variants escaping current therapies? Very important question. And are the vaccines going to be less effective against the variants? Another important question. All right, so we'll start with the um, B uh, or sorry, the UK variant, B117, and apologies for the background. It, um, hopefully, 
it, it looked better when it was on my small screen, but now I'm looking at it and uh, it looks like it might induce a few seizures. Um, if anyone needs help, you know, <laughs> please call on Zoom. Um, so this is the uh, a map of the UK variant and how it uh, um, emerged uh, over the winter, and it was spectacularly fast. So the top left is kind of in in the two weeks between November 30th and December 13th, uh, the proportion of virus uh, of the virus that was being sequenced, which again in the UK was quite a bit that was uh, being called B117. You can see that it was really highest in Southeast England and you know just beginning a little bit in 40 or 50 percent maybe in, in, in the London area. Uh, two weeks later, you know all of Southeast England is essentially uh, greater than 80 percent of the UK variant and then you know after an additional four weeks nearly the entire country all, almost all the virus being sequenced was the UK variant. Um, so it was it was a rapid takeover, and when modeling studies were looking at how, how it shifted, um, they looked at the r naught, so the reproductive number of that particular virus. So like, how likely is it to uh, someone infected with the virus to transmit to, to um, additional people? And the r naught was increased by either 0.4 to 0.7 compared to the normal wild type virus. So it was definitely appeared to be more, more infectious. And when you sequence it, it had 23 genetic mutations compared to the original Wuhan strain. So nine of those mutations were in the spike protein. Uh, one of them was the D614G, which we've talked about here before, which is now seen in the majority of SARS-CoV-2 cases around the world. A few of the other ones were this N501Y, which is located at the receptor binding motif for the ACE2 receptor, again, a very important spot. Um, and there's this Delta H69V70, uh, which is at the end terminus of the RBD, and another one at the end terminus of the RBD, y1, the Delta Y144, um, and so on, the A570D. And together, basically, these mutations stabilized the up confirmation of the receptor binding domain and enhanced ACE2 binding, particularly this N501Y and A57D. And I'll talk more about that as we move on. And these other mutations, um, in the RBD actually helped the virus evade some of the uh, immune response from, from prior infection uh, or some of the antibodies directed to the ACE2 binding site. So first of all, this D614G, we, heard, we already heard a lot about it. Um, and I won't go spend too much time on this, but uh, it appeared um, in a number of studies to maybe be a little bit more infectious than the, the wild type virus. And, and here, um, this study, a recent study that was published in Nature showed uh, that both in hamsters and in human upper airway tissue cells, uh, there were higher titers uh, when, when you compare the, the D614G variant to the wild type variant. Um, sorry, this, the G variant to the D variant. Um, and sorry, it's a little blurry here, but uh, in nasal wash, uh, in, in hamsters, there was a significant increase in the viral titers. And then in these human upper airway tissue cells, it was uh, significantly um, more virus was present all the way up um, to five days post-infection. All right, so getting back to that up con confirmation, down confirmation. So this, the SARS-CoV-2 spike, uh, is, it's in a trimer. So there's three of them. And uh, the spike can, um, be up or down. And when it's down, it doesn't bind as well as when it's up. And some of the mutations actually stabilize the conformation of each of these spike trimers into the up position. And so one of the differences that was noticed with the UK variant is that the, the, all of the spike trimers um, appear to bind the ACE2 receptor as opposed to only one with the comp so only one of the three would typically uh, bind the ACE2 receptor with the wild type virus just because of uh, steric issues. But because of these amino acid changes, uh, it was able to bind two, sometimes all three of the, uh, the, the spike trimers to the ACE2. So really enhanced binding. So yeah, so this, this enhanced binding, again, um, partly uh, due to this one mutation, the N501Y in the UK variant. Uh, increases viral fitness, and this is the re relative replicate of fitness uh, of um, the virus in hamster uh, nasal washes. So uh, on the top 
right uh, are nasal washes from hamsters. And you can see that what's plotted is the relative viral titers compared to the wild type virus. And you can see by day four, there's about twice as much virus, the UK variant, as or with than compared to the, um, I'm sorry, the, the N501 variant compared to the um, uh, wild type. And similarly, if you look at um, the trach aspirate of hamsters, and, and on the left is the donor uh, hamsters, and on the right is the trach aspirate of, of the recipient, if there's a, a transfer of infection. And again, you'll see this um, significant increase uh, over wild type, and, and particularly so as you go further into the illness, so four days post-infection. Um, in um, kind of physical chem chemistry studies, they show that the actual binding of, to ACE2 with, these, with this mutation increases the KD by greater than 350 fold. So it really increases the binding of the virus to the ACE2 receptor. And, and it seems like it's, it's something that the virus likes because it's the same mutation has been seen in the UK variant, the Brazil variant, the South Africa variant, uh, and others as well. All right, so moving on, and please feel free to jump in and ask questions. I'm not monitoring the chat, but if, Jill, if you just interrupt me, if somebody has a question, that'd be great. Yep. Um, so the next one is this, this South African variant. And it, again, it started in the Eastern Cape. And again, very quickly, it kind of took over um, and was the, the, um, the overwhelming proportion of the genomes by um, late November. So it was first detected in October, and by late November, it was kind of taking over. Uh, started actually in the Eastern Cape, and then became the predominant strain in the Eastern and Western Cape. It kind of just followed some migration routes uh, in, in South Africa. This is work from another group in South Africa. So why is B1351 so scary, the South African bird variant so scary? So and I apologize for the figure over there. I had to kind of piece it together. Um, but right now, it's, it's, a, it's in a very low prevalence across the U.S., but um, it, there are a couple of issues with it. One is it, that it appears to really um, um, have a significant impact on the efficacy of, or, or the vaccines seem to be uh, limited. Um, the efficacy of vaccines seem to be limited against these strains, um, but we don't know yet too much about the transmissibility of this variant. And so a group here modeled the uh, relationship between reduced vaccine efficacy and relative transmissibility. So the relative transmissibility is kind of unknown, but if you can see if the, the um, vac vaccine efficacy is reduced even like 50%, if the relative transmissibility is even 1.2 uh, fold more than the wild type, you know, the, this particular variant is going to just be the dominant variant in the U.S. Um, and, and the color represents the percent of hospitalizations due to that, to that variant. So um, still learning a little bit more about this strain, but um, there, there is potential for it to kind of take over, particularly if it, if it is a little bit more transmissible than the, the circulating strains that are present. Um, it, in sort of preliminary studies, it does seem to evade about 21% of naturally acquired uh, immunity, and then we'll talk more about the how the how it impacts vaccine efficacy later on. Um, but one of the Pfizer studies study suggested a two thirds decrease in neutralization ability. I am going to interrupt you with a question from Dr. Little. Um, do we have adequate coverage nationally of SARS-CoV-2 sequencing to know what our U.S. prevalence of this variant or others are? Uh, the answer that's no. <laughs> <laughs> I keep wondering why everybody's like, you know, it's only at X percent. If we're sequencing 1 percent, how are we making these estimates of it's only present at 0.7 percent? That's a, it's a very, very important question. And it is ramping up. Um, so there's a number of sort of initiatives to increase sequencing um, across um, the country. The ORD and the VA has actually just started one, but everything moves slowly. Um, but they're going to be trying to sequence a huge proportion of, of viruses as well. Um, do, do we know what what percent are uh, what percentage we're at in terms of sequencing? Is, is it one percent? Um, <laughs> the last I heard, it was around one percent. Well, around one percent. Yeah. Yeah. And things may have. It's also 
things have slowed down since the virus has slowed down a little bit. Um, so I don't, you know, like I know that uh, the Anderson lab is, is kind of not sequencing nearly as many viruses as they were before, but it, I'm assuming it's just because not as many are being submitted to them. Uh, but, um, yeah, I don't know the latest in terms of exactly what percentage is being sequenced, but the last I heard it was still quite a bit. Um, yeah, so you know, I'm going to start with this. This stuff, these are papers that actually came out, I think, last week in the New England Journal. Um, and they basically looked at the efficacy of the AstraZeneca vaccine, the Chadox, Chad Adox 1, and the Novavax vaccine in South Africa. And it looks so hot for the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, so the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, the, the efficacy overall was a, estimated at 20% in South Africa and 10% against the variants that carried the, the B, 10% against the B1351 variant, the South, the, considered the South African variant. Um, but if you look at the graph itself, you know, the, the, there were, it's, a, it's a little odd, but essentially they, the vaccine and the placebo cumulative event rate are essentially the same, and maybe even the vaccine rate might be higher. I didn't, efficacy to 50% efficacy. So I, essentially, I don't think it's demonstrated anything, any sort of effectiveness. The Novavax fared a little bit better, and it roughly had about a 50% efficacy in, in South Africa. Um, similarly, the Janssen vaccine, when they kind of subgrouped out their initial study, they found it in South Africa, their effectiveness was about 57% compared to the worldwide effectiveness that was around 72%. So again, it really does look like the this variant is um, going to be tough. So what is it about this variant? So this variant carries the D614G and the N501Y that we mentioned uh, that were already in the UK variant. And then it has all these other mutations uh, in spike, uh, also at the furin cleavage site. Uh, one in the nuclear capsid that may represent an escape mutation for a B cell epitope. Uh, and then we're going to kind of focus on, or I'm going to focus on here, and, um, these, these other two here, um, uh, mutations. So the E484K has gotten a lot of press, um, and it's appeared in several lineages around the world. If you remember that one case that was a persistent shedder, sort of de novo developed this mutation. Um, it is, appears to be associated with a 10 to 100 fold reduction in neutralization um, by convalescent plasma. And we'll talk about how it's actually also associated, associated with decreased neutralization by monoclonals and by vaccination. So here is um, a uh, sort of a checkerboard of a bunch of different mutations and a bunch of different monoclonal antibodies. And red is bad. And if you see my arrow, here's the 484. K, actually, these are all the 484 mutations, and it's it's essentially red almost all the way across. So it really does impact um, many of the monoclonals that are out there. Um, the ones up here are not the commercial ones, but we'll show you a little bit more data with the commercial ones. Here. So a little refresher on SARS-CoV-2 neutralizing antibodies. Um, so there's four classes of antibodies uh, that were that bind to spike. Uh, neutralizing antibodies that bind to spike. Um, there are those that block ACE2 and only bind to the up confirmation of the uh, spike protein. There are ones that block ACE2 and also bind to the up and down uh, confirmation of the RBD. There are those that bind outside the ACE2 binding site, and bind both up and down RBDs. And then there are ones that don't block ACE2, but, but do bind to the up confirmation of RBD. And so you know, these are all different sites along the spike. Um, so it's important, um, you know, when we think of treating uh, things that have high evolutionary potential, we like to treat with different classes like HIV, right? Different classes of drugs or, or, um, um, or, yeah, or TV, et cetera. So getting back to this, um, UK, uh, sorry, the, the South African variant. So um, here's when, when we looked at convalescent plasma, 
Um, so what we did, or what they did here, excuse me, is um, they took virus from the first wave and they took ser convalescent serum from individuals from the first wave and from the second wave in South Africa. So the pre-variant uh, phase, uh, phase and then the, or sorry, wave and then the, the post-variant wave. In the pre-variant wave, they made sure that the virus didn't have 44K. In both convalescent plasma from both of those waves it did really well against the first wave infection. Um, but when you looked at the second wave, so which is the B1351 or also known as 501Y V2 or South Africa variant, the, the first wave convalescent plasma essentially didn't, didn't work very well. And, and so again, showing that this, this new virus has really escaped uh, many of the uh, antibodies that the patients are developing, the people are developing to the wild type virus. Um, and David Ho's group really kind of drilled on this a little bit more, looking at some of the commercial monoclonal antibodies and some of the other ones that are out there. And you can see here on um, for B1351 and this B1351 tell to 9 that these RBM directed uh, antibodies are essentially knocked out. Um, and this includes this is Lily CoV555 is Pamlinumab and <laughs> Bamlanumab, and this is the uh, Regeneron Casavirubimab. Um, and both of these are essentially knocked out by these mutations in B1351. Now, um, luckily, the, the second uh, companion antibody in the Regeneron cocktail seems to still work very well. Um, but, it's, it's... Uh, but the second antibody in the uh, Lily uh, cocktail does not, and that's shown here, where this is this is the full Lily cocktail, and essentially there is very very poor neutralization activity of either the Bamlin in that alone or the Lily cocktail um, down here. Um, and this is with authentic viruses and pseudoviruses. So um, the the Regeneron cocktail, even though it's clear that this the Castorivimab is not doing much, the its second antibody is able to um, still neutralize the virus. And so uh, in both settings, the, that, the Regeneron cocktail seems to be working. Some of these other ones are still in, under investigation. All right, so what about um, plasma after vaccination? So um, what, is, um, what does that look like? So here is, um, uh, they took virus with the 44K um, and they took um, plasma from vaccinated individuals and they looked at it against, um, sorry, they, they took plasma from vaccinated individuals and looked at uh, it against three strains. So the, the Washington one, which is close to the wild type, the UK variant, the B117, and then the, then the South African variant. And looking at both Moderna and for Pfizer, uh, they were they showed a significant decrease in the neutralization uh, ability, almost a uh, tenfold for Pfizer and twelvefold for Moderna. Uh, so not not looking that great. Um, however, uh, in a uh, sort of epidemiologic study uh, where they actually looked at effectiveness in the real world, it did appear that the Pfizer vaccine was seventy five percent effective against PCR confirmed infection and disease against this variant in Qatar. Now the question really is, the question I have, and it wasn't clear from the publication was, uh, how far out after vaccination were they looking? Was it just in the first couple of weeks um, after the second, or sorry, you know, after the second, two weeks after the second dose, but in the first couple of months after vaccination, or was this further out? And I think it was close in, so, um, but it did seem to be effective uh, against the virus. The strain. So the third mutation that's important in this South African variant is the K4B417N, um, and this one um, again, this is a um, work done by Michelle Nussenswig's group um, in New York, and they show that you know here again the E484 was really knocking out all the anything that had any class two activity, um, essentially gone. Uh, but the K4171 now is, is, is knocking out class one activity. So with the combination of both, uh, 
you, you would worry that you're starting to lose all class one and class two uh, active antibodies. Um, it's not clear exactly if it improves or worsens ACE2 binding, however, this particular mutation. All right, so moving on from that one to the P1 lineage, um, which is the Brazil mutation. And it has very similar mutations uh, to the South African variant. It has the N501Y, the E484K, and it has this K417T, which is very similar to the K417N. Uh, um, and again, on this map, you can see that the bulk of the mutations are in the spike region of the, of the genome, with a handful of nucleocapsid and nucleotide differences. So this. This uh, variant was first detected in Manaus uh, in December 2020. So this is um, data from Manaus. And uh, in the top left, you can see there's that huge uh, wave of infection kind of in the spring of 2020 in Manaus and you know, a, huge, uh, uh, a huge number of deaths and then kind of the, the wave uh, calmed down. And then again, the second wave hit in January 2021. And uh, again, even spiked even higher than it did the first time. Um, the uh, rate of um, acceleration of analysis kind of similar to what we saw in with the UK variant, where over literally over a couple of weeks, it became the predominant virus. So here, again, from sort of early to, early to mid December to essentially uh, early to mid January, it, it went from you know, a very small percentage to uh, almost 100% of the virus being uh, sequenced in Manaus. Um, and it turned out when they were kind of going back and looking at individuals, up to 25% of the people that were getting the P1 variant were reinfections. Um, so that was pretty scary. And then what about our variant, <laughs> the California variant? So this one was detected simultaneously in San Francisco and LA. Um, there's essentially three spike mutations uh, that seem to be of importance. And this was as of um, March, I guess, uh, 2021. Um, the proportion of the California variants worldwide was very small. In the US was still relatively small, but it was very, very significant across California in, in the winter time, essentially. And so the um, our variant, the California variant, does appear to have new, reduced neutralization by the monoclonal antibodies. And so um, this is why um, Bamlin-Invab was, uh, why the uh, state state health department essentially told everyone to stop using Bamlin-Invab on its own. As you can see here that while um, the wild type is the dark line, the uh, blue line is our California variant, you can see that there is a reduction in activity of some of these antibodies. So this one, uh, which I think is not yet approved, is uh, Regdenivimab. Isirimab is one of the, of the Regeneron antibodies, the second Regeneron antibody. This is the companion antibody in Lily, so there's a little bit of loss of effectiveness here, but essentially Bamlinivimab is ineffective against this variant. Um, and what about vaccines? So when they looked at um, uh, serum from vac vaccinated individuals and compared the neutralization ability of that vaccine against wild type to the California variant, um, there does appear to be less effective against the California variant. Um, they didn't really quantify this in this paper, but it does. It did seem like uh, in, in all cases it was less effective than it was against the wild type. And again, this was a pseudotype virus. So it appears what's going on is that the two, the S13I and the W152C, uh, which are mutations in the N-terminal domain, are really impacting uh, evasion of antibodies. And then this L452R um, also is helping the virus evade, but it also improves ACE2 binding, which may increase its effect infectiousness as well. So kind of summarizing this together, uh, this, this group, um, Led by Garcia Beltran, kind of put this figure together, and I thought it was really nice. So they took and they they used um, a bunch of sera and they um, tested against pseudoviruses from all these different strains, and they kind of summarized in this figure. But essentially, it shows that you know at least for the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine, 
there's really good cross neutralization for the wild type, for the D14G, for the UK variant. Um, <clears throat> and it's, it's decent for the, uh, uh, the California variant. I mean, the B11298 is a Danish variant. Uh, maybe that mink variant, I'm not sure. But then we start getting into the P2 and P1. So this is the Brazilian variant. This is the Japanese variant that's closely related to the Brazil variant. And then the uh, South African variant. You know, you're starting to see really poor cross Um and, um, and then, of course, it, our vaccines don't work that great against uh, other coronaviruses like SARS-1. So B1351 remains a concern. So what about some of these newer variants? So this is uh, B1, B1526 is the new New York variant. Um, and it's, you know, first elect, detected in the late 2020, but again, by February 2021, it really took off in New York, uh, in the tri-state area there. And uh, accounted for 43% of genomes. About half of them contained that same mutation, that E484K. So really that is another, you know, it's just pointing to a convergent evolution on that one mutation, that it's really helpful for the virus. It really improves binding. Um, so it's happening over and over again. Um, the, uh, a few other mutations are present on the antibody epitopes and also um, um, on that internal domain of, the, uh, of spike. Um, but when, when this is modeled, this is actually Joel's one of, uh, some work that Joel did um, uh, and showed that the growth rate, which this is a lot lower than I thought, uh, the exponential growth rate was much higher for this variant, particularly the one that was carrying the e 48 k um, compared to California variant and the UK. Um, and again, convalescent plasma appears not to work quite as well against this variant. So um, convalescent plasma against comparing wild type with the D614G to the uh, New York variant, both with and without the E484K, just clearly a decrement, maybe a threefold to fourfold decrement uh, in um, uh, activity. And, but it was definitely worse with the ones that were carrying that E484K. So the next one is this Indian variant, uh, B1617. So Again, it's, it's really taking off. It's sweeping across the country in India. The death rate continues to rise. The cases are finally starting to decrease as of May 18th. There's a little, there's a little bit of hope, but remember the death rate typically lags three weeks from the, uh, um, the change in cases. So right now the death rate continues to rise. It's, like it's in a horrible situation. And the thing to remember about India is that um, you need to take all numbers with a grain of salt because it's really hard to collect data there. And, um, you know, there's probably some multiplicative factor of, of both cases and deaths involved. Uh, so what, is, what about this variant? What's um, unique about this one? So this one has eight mutations in the spike protein, including that L452R that's seen in the California variant. And a, some of them carry this E484Q, which is similar to the E484K. And it's also increasing um, binding uh, to the RBD. Uh, so here's uh, the impact of monoclonal antibodies uh, on this virus. And so there's the wild type in black, um, the South African variant in green, and the Indian variant in, in um, yellow, orange, I guess. And the two Regeneron antibodies appear to work reasonably well, but um, the Bamlin and MAP, again, not doing anything against this particular variant. Uh, luckily, the uh, companion antibody uh, in the lily cocktail does seem to have efficacy. And then again, vaccine effectiveness against this variant. So it appears to drop sevenfold. Um, and this is the, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine. So even uh, these probably the most highly effective vaccines are, are uh, uh, significantly less effective against multiple, multiple ones of these variants, including this Indian variant. So this is just a map of the mutations, and this is on the website of um, the Anderson Lab, or the, um, and it just, I just point this out. It's a, it's, a, it's a nice map for you guys to keep track of things. They keep adding mutations or sorry, variants of interest and concern as, as they pop up. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. 
All right, so where do things stand uh, in the US? Uh, it looks like right now the B117 UK variant is really taking off. Um, and so you can see that while back in um, January, February, it was a relatively small proportion. Right now, it's, it's really a significant proportion of the viruses, probably 60 to 70% as of early May uh, across the US. It does look like that P1 variant, the Brazilian variant, is starting to take off. Um, but we're not seeing a lot of uh, the uh, South African variant just yet. And then in California, um, similarly, you know, the, these two were the, um, sorry, this one and this one, sorry, this one and this one were the California variant, this combination. They were you know, essentially 100% of the virus back in January, and they're slowly disappearing in the UK variant as they come out. Now remember, this is a proportion, so uh, the numbers are actually going down. Um, but uh, of the ones that we are sequencing, it does appear that uh, a huge proportion are now the UK variant. Um, there are a few of uh, the P1 variants uh, coming in. All right, so on to the next question. Uh, so will decay neutralization titers post-vaccination make us more susceptible to the variant. So, you know, we, we know that the vaccination, the duration of effectiveness of vaccination, we don't know what it is, but we assume that it's probably going to be something like a year possibly. Does that mean that towards the end of that year, we're going to be more susceptible to the variants? Uh, that's one question. And so this is a great modeling study that just came out um, where they looked at um, the relative efficacy of these vaccines based on the neutralization titers. So they took some of the primary data from these vaccines and they looked at the neutralization titers that each of these vaccines produced and they mapped it against the protective efficacy in the clinical trials. And then they took their data and they validated it against this BBB152, uh, this Bharat biotech vaccine that just, um, just came out. And their model fit perfectly. So they predicted about an 85% effectiveness and essentially that's what it had. So um, just to make, make sure, make uh, it's a little bit more clear. This is the mean, this on the right is the mean neutralization level of the, um, of the different uh, vaccines. So this is the uh, Moderna vaccine. This is the Novavax vaccine, this is the Pfizer vaccine. Again, all these look really good where, you know, nearly 100% of people are, are protected, a very, very small percentage are not. Um, as you go down, this is the Russian vaccine, almost as good, and then the CHEDX2, um, and uh, going down to some of these other vaccines. And, and some of these other ones actually look less effective than convalescent plasma. Um, so I thought this was a pretty nifty piece. So they took this data, and then they said, how does initial efficacy impact future efficacy? So if a vaccine is really good up front, what does that mean, you know, a couple of months down the line? So, so they predicted um, looking at sort of decay rates, uh, which we believe are relatively standard, you know, like decay rates for antibodies were relatively linear for people. But even though the decay rate of an antibody may be linear, linear it doesn't mean the effectiveness is going to be a linear, the decay in effectiveness may not be linear. Um, and so this is a, a great um, graph where they show that if the initial effectiveness is, you know, 98%, 250 days, you're still going to be at 97% effective. But if your initial effectiveness was only 70%, uh, then by 250 days, your effect, the effectiveness of the vaccine is going to drop below 40%. So um, again, really highlighting that there are differences between these vaccines and the, the, the mRNA vaccines are quite incredible in, in, in both um, presumably how long we'll get uh, duration of effectiveness. And again, here is they're, they're just graphing the same data in another fashion that if your initial effectiveness is good at 250 days, you're going to be fine. But if your initial effectiveness is only 80% by about 150 days or so, you're going to be down to 70% efficacy, um, and et cetera. Um, they do um, point out that they're, this is only taking into the effect of the neutralizing antibody and not any other effects from T cells or B cells, which may pr provide additional benefit, particularly later on. 
Um, but just highlighting for neutralizing antibodies, the, the decay in efficacy, even though the decay in titers may be linear, the efficacy of decay will, is not linear. Um, and then, Andre, I'm just giving you a nine minute warning now. Um, okay. you're, you're fine, just wanted to let you know. Okay, thanks. Um, so then extrapolating that to the variants. Um, so they didn't put specific variants into this figure, but you know we know that um, certain variants have have escape mutations where a lot of these antibodies don't bind as well or, or overall. There's a twofold decrease in the effectiveness of the antibody versus fivefold versus tenfold. You can see that the predicted efficacy uh, can drop off uh, um, pretty quickly. Um, and if that's the initial efficacy, you can imagine that the uh, efficacy four to six months down the line, or, or six to eight months down the line, might actually be uh, significantly lower and probably not in a, in a good realm. Um, all right, so um, last question I'm gonna ask you, will, will the boosters save us? I don't know. <laughs> but for, we do know that for flu, getting the flu vaccine year over year has been a couple of studies kind of showing the same thing, that with each successive flu vaccination, the, the boost in antibody uh, seems to go down, um, at least in these studies. And this is just comparing a couple of different flu studies and showing that, that the, the um, full change in titer, uh, the first year the vaccine is given versus the second one that's given. Um, so there is a chance that the booster here may not be helpful. And I couldn't find a whole lot of data on this, but I did find one paper, and this is actually by uh, ben Merle, he used to be here, um, so he's over in Sweden um, right now, and they did a study in macaques, um, and they vaccinated three macaques with, uh, a, this is a you know, protein-based vaccine, they initially vaccinated with a wild-type uh, RBD, uh, and then later on they boosted them with a uh, RBD from the um, South African variant. And then they looked at neutralization of both the wild type virus and then the variant virus. And I'll, I'll to um, maybe just shorten this, I'll bring your attention down to this figure right here. So this is after just the first two vaccines, vaccinations with just the wild type virus. And that you can see that the um, it's working really get well against the wild type virus, but the titers, of, you need a much higher titer of virus, uh, sorry, a titer of plasma uh, to neutralize the, the variant virus, the, the South African variant virus. Now, after they gave that third vaccine, the booster that is a cross neutralization, uh, provides cross neutralization, um, uh, the new plasma looked great against both viruses. And so, um, you know, if, if we can extrapolate from three macaques to the, the human race, um, that's good news. Um, and I think. That's all I had. Yeah, that's pretty much it. So sorry, there was like a, a lot of data and probably a little bit of a dense talk, but maybe if anyone has any questions, please ask. Thanks, Sanjay. Um, Susan, do you want to, you've made a couple of comments. Do you want to unmute and, and chat? Sure. Um, I just wanted to ask, well, I'll just ask my last question. Has anybody modeled, I mean, given that what looks like P1 is starting to creep up, certainly in California at a, hmm, I don't know if alarming is the right word, but impressive rate, has anybody modeled uh, the domestic spread of that variant or any others as was done for B117? Because that, those predictions, those models look, came out pretty accurately. Yeah, um, so I, I didn't see anything for, for P1, there there have been some models with the South African variant, but they again, I think right now it's not clear for P1 and the South African variant how much more transmissible they are. Yeah. Um, uh, so that piece is a, a kind of um, a little bit up in the air. But if you can remember from that one slide, where if 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 it is more transmissible, it's um, it's clearly going to uh, both of them potentially could take over given their particularly the South African variant, since it does escape uh, much better, uh, both the vaccine responses and, and, and monoclonals. 
So, so maybe I can just ask then, so is it, is it really not clear based on the Brazilian data that P1 is not, is it equivocal still that it's not more transmissible? So I think it, it probably is. Okay. Um, I, I think we just don't know exactly how much. Okay. okay. Andre, this is Josh. So how would you interpret the Brazilian experience in, in terms of the value of, of T cells in the immune response? And do you think it's different in vaccinated versus infected people? So I do think it's different in vaccinated versus infected people. Um, and I think that's gonna hopefully be <laughs> useful to us. Um, it, it, it did, <laughs> the Brazilian data, the Manaus data looked awful, right? Like it, did, it looked like the T cells were not contributing the second time around at all. Um, but I, I do think a, a natural infection versus uh, at least the mRNA vaccines, um, there, there is a difference. Um, you know, the immunology is still pretty complicated, but um, I do think there's probably going to be a little bit. Uh, there, there's a difference between the mRNA vaccines at least and uh, a natural infection. I don't know about the adenoviral vaccines and, and some of the other ones. There's going to be a huge impact. Um, the data that uh, Galit showed kind of suggested suggested some of that too. Would anyone else like to ask a question or make a comment? Quick comment. Hello? Yeah. Please, Lalo. Yeah, no, I think uh, that was a fantastic talk by Sanjay. But my comment goes about our policy at UCSD and our understanding of plasma. I think of plasma in terms of antiretroviral therapy. So if you use plasma and you don't know what you're using, it's like using monotherapy. You create selecting pressure and promote resistance in HIV. And that was a problem from the original times with the AUP when people didn't even know what they were using. In fact, the retrospective analysis of those studies published in Nature and the New England Journal that Sanjay present showed that those patients received less than 160 of uh, titration for neutralization antibody titers. And I think what we learned retrospectively is that our institution was the only one who didn't jump into this hype and hope and try to do things rigorously. And um, we know that uh, plasma, uh, let's forget about the efficacy for now, with good neutralizing antibodies more than 1,024 or higher, like the one published in New England by Romina Lipsters and the one doing in other parts of our country, uh, really prevent those issues. And in fact, the South African variant has some three and a half fold dilution less effectiveness, but you can still uh, have some effectiveness, uh, at least in vitro. Uh, unlike the monoclonal antibodies that of course they lose completely the activity as Sanjay pointed out. So I think what I'm trying to say is that um, it's very important to understand what we do, not to jump to the hype and hope without really a, good science, um, and yeah, uh, the titers matter in uh, convalescent plasma. Thanks, Laura. Yeah, it's a good, very good point. Um, the titers, and you know, we obviously for convalescent plasma, we don't know the mix of what types of antibodies are, are present as well, if it's a you know, single active monoclonal versus, um, I mean, sorry, not monoclonal, but a single, uh, type of antibody versus a, a combination most of the time. Well, it's nine o'clock. I'm gonna echo what everyone else is saying, which was this was fabulous and extremely comprehensive. Um, a really great update for all of us. And yes, it is really hard to keep up with everything that's coming out. So this was this was a great summary for us, Sanjay. Thank you so much. Cool. All right. Well, thanks for having me. And, uh... You'll have to give us another update maybe later in the year. No, I'm just kidding. Next year. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, enjoy the weekend. Hopefully, some people get a little extra time for themselves.
We'll see you next week.